a very good afternoon to our honorable vice chancellor professor manoj kumar dhar sir a uh, very good afternoon to my dear friend professor perry hobson thanks thanks for coming perry uh, a very good afternoon to my colleagues my supporters nikhil ramjeet kannappan jeet who have been uh, part of this journey with me and who have been supporting us in this particular venture uh, uh, for the information of my experts uh, dr perry hobson and my honorable vice chancellor sir today we have reached double figures so this is our 10th lecture and we are really happy we we just initiated this journey and we were not aware of the fact that we would go this far and we have been getting experts from all around the globe sir from egypt from kazakhstan malaysia philippines we have been a lot of uh, students and teachers from philippines have been joining us from malaysia kazakhstan egypt hungary we had uh, students joining in us so that's that's a nice thing and a heartening thing sir and uh, the best aspect is that uh, uh, we are Uh, we have our experts lined up till at least 25th of june so that's 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 a very important aspect that we have uh, uh, i would also request all the participants again to keep their audios on mute and their videos off so that we can get maximum benefit for the experts of today uh, for the benefit of all the participants today uh, we have honorable vice chancellor of university of jammu professor manoj kumar dhar sir is a uh, is a biotechnologist uh, Uh, of world level and he has been one of the top biotechnologists of our country for long time uh, his research has been pioneering and he has he has been the one who has been uh, guiding all of us all the youngsters within the university even the senior colleague towards the path of research so he's a very big and a huge motivating factor so since we were reaching our double figures so i thought we should have somebody an elder to bless us over here that's why we invited you sir Uh, sir mm-hmm. has a large vast experience of heading biotechnology department and he was controller of examination uh, registrar of the university and his his he has projects worth crores of rupees so that's millions of rupees and that's that's a huge number i think by far the most that anybody in north india has and he sits on very prominent boards of uh, government of india uh, dbt and other and uh, it would be great to listen to him uh, sir you know there sir over to you sir so good morning uh, good afternoon everybody and uh, i hope i am audible yes sir you are sir yes sir so uh, it's really a matter of great honor and uh, privilege for me to join this uh, webinar series which has been initiated by sir parikshit singh manhas uh, our my dear colleague in the university and a very uh, brilliant uh, academician and especially he is an expert in the area of tourism the hospitality management um i i think you already listened to the kind of accolades he has received so uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here this afternoon and uh, let me also extend a very warm welcome to professor perry hobson uh, welcome to you uh, to this webinar in fact when uh, professor parikshit talked to me about this webinar series which he had initiated and today is the 10th uh, lecture which is being hosted so it was really uh, wonderful to know that he has been able to connect uh, with the scholars students and uh, academicians from various parts of the world and it's really heartening to see that <clears throat> in this uh, situation when we are facing uh, the covid-19 uh, issues so in this condition also he is trying to keep alive the subject of tourism vis-a-vis the effects which uh, covid-19 uh, would have on uh, the tourism industry Uh, as all of you are aware that uh, jammu and kashmir uh, is known for many tourist places and uh, tourism is the major industry i would say in the in the erstwhile state of jammu and kashmir and also now in the union territories of jammu and kashmir and ladakh so it's a favorite destination 
but over the years uh, because of many issues the tourism industry has suffered a lot and but there are now efforts being made to revive that and uh, to bring back that glory of uh, the tourism potential which our uh, state or swell state and present union territory has so in that direction our school of hospitality and tourism management in the university of jammu is doing a wonderful job they are actually training the students the future uh, experts the future uh, persons who would go to industry who would be absorbed in the industrial uh, milieu so all that is being done with the great amount of care and with great amount of commitment and this kind of education is being imparted here so i would say that uh, this is our one of the most prestigious departments in the university which is doing wonderfully well and i am sure that the kind of series uh, which has been initiated and many other efforts which uh, professor parikshit uh, makes i am sure that uh, this would be a source of inspiration to many students many uh, faculty members who definitely like to move on uh, his path which he is laying actually and uh, in other areas also uh, his role his commitment is uh, worth praising because he is uh, he is a part of our he is the actually the president of our innovation council and he is also set up uh, the section 8 company which is a which is a non profit company first time in the university of jammu which is actually driving the students and the faculty members towards innovative practices innovations entrepreneurship and so on so <clears throat> regarding the topic i'd briefly say because we have the experts here i am not an expert in this area just as a layman i think uh, the topic which has been chosen for today wellness then uh, health and medical tourism you know that so far as the traditional knowledge is concerned india is bestowed with a uh, lot of traditional knowledge in ayurveda in uh, naturopathy in yoga many other things and which need to be uh, discussed which need to be taken forward and the world needs to be made aware of all those practices all those traditions which our country uh, is proud of and i think uh, when we talk of medical tourism uh, before this problem i i read somewhere that it was going to be one of the major industries so far as the indian context is concerned about 9 billion dollar uh, industry this medical tourism if i am if i am not wrong i just read it somewhere so i think uh, there's lot of potential unfortunately because of this uh, situation we are uh, we are facing a very unprecedented situation because of covid 19 but i think uh, as the things improve uh, the situation will be better and i wish and pray uh, for health and uh, safety of all of you and i am sure that during these testing times as we remain engaged with these webinars and uh, other uh, lecture series we keep ourselves updated and try to see that how we can innovate and once we come out of this situation how we can put those things into practice so in that sense i consider this lecture series wonderful and i see that many participants are there and it has been almost full house for all the uh, lectures which have been delivered on this uh, platform so i uh, on my behalf and on behalf of university of jammu compliment uh, professor parikshit singh manhas uh, nikhil chadak and uh, other colleagues who are joining from uh, i think central university of kashmir we have uh, some colleague joining from Dr. there and from there doctor ram ji yeah yeah okay so welcome to all of you and my compliments and i wish you all the best i am sure that it's already a grand success because the moment you say that this is the 10th lecture that only shows that this is already a grand success and you are going ahead uh, strongly in this path of success so i wish you all the luck and uh, stay safe and keep yourself 
and your family members safe uh, you follow all the precautions and the uh, advisories which have been issued by the governments so once again thank you so much for inviting me and uh, wish you all the best i i'll now look forward to the lecture by perry thank you so much for inviting me thank you sir thanks a lot sir thank you thanks for your kind words and your encouraging words uh, obviously when the uh, when the leader of the institution supports you it really goes a long way and all my echo loads are because of you only sir uh, for all the audience i'll just start uh, sharing my screen so uh, as we have it and the way we do about it uh, i'll i'll just build a prelude to this particular aspect and the today's topic and then uh, uh, we'll shift over to uh, professor perry and then he's going to take over from me so i'll just build up a small little uh, aspect that what are, how things are moving and how things are building up uh, we are live on fb also and things are going very smoothly so a lot of our students are joining over there uh, we chose this today's topic because of the fact that a lot of students were uh, referring to us that why not health wellness medical which is going to be the core competence of india and how it is going to build up Uh, as i uh, talked about in my earlier lectures i started with the fact that i'm going to give you or share a couple of updates uh, with you and uh, i've been regularly sharing in my slide the updates uh, i think somebody has a uh, audio on we have somebody's audio on nikhil can you just uh, check it out yes sir yes sir i'm checking it just mute it off okay so uh, so something regarding the, what we have been talking about last time i talked about gave a little bit brief about the inclusive response of un uh, wto regarding vulnerable groups and i was talking about uh, covid 19 and women and today i'm going to talk with uh, for a couple of minutes regarding covid 19 and people with disabilities so there has been uh, obviously unwto has been playing a lot of stress on the fact that how people with disabilities during covid 19 are been taken care of and some immediate response that it has guided its member states to build up was repatriation of these people without any delay uh, courtesy accessible accommodation so that was a priority that was being worked up by unwto and all member states have been uh, following it up peer support by all the tmcs and dmos to the displaced people's organization so that's an important aspect because we have a lot of people who are being displaced because of covid 19 and who are losing their uh, day to day life daily life earnings and that's uh, one of the factors and tourism for all uh, more than ever in 2020 so that's what they are trying to push up because uh, we firmly we belonging to hospitality and tourism industry firmly believe Uh, on one very important aspect and that is that tourism is going to be the road to recovery for economic slowdowns i know uh, tourism will not be the first to start its recovery but as i have been again and again saying it will be fastest to recover yes it might be the last or the second last on the road to recovery but it will be the fastest that is going to recover and i'm sure about that and we have been saying about the fact that uh, some recovery related aspects that tourism for all policies should be built up in such a way that uh, nobody is left Uh, untouched and everybody whether he's he or she possesses any disabilities or not should be taken care of technology interventions i've been keep uh, repeating about that fact use of innovative technology to help the people uh, displaced people or dis uh, people with disabilities is going to be one of the very important aspect for which uh, all the countries are working hard and technology interventions with this innovation techniques are being built up is also being talked about or spoken in a very big way so coming back to the topic that we are going to talk about uh, today is uh, health wellness medical tourism so the fact is that uh, wellness and medical are in a way a subset of our health tourism we have our expert dr perry hobson to speak about it today i'll just build a preview due to it but wellness has been a one of those fa factors where uh, at least within india a lot of emphasis is being laid off late and ministry of tourism government of india has been constantly talking about the fact that this needs to be worked up this needs to be looked up and this needs to be worked up and what i've been talking about uh, uh, the fact that uh, we have to have uh, as i talked about in my earlier lectures also there has to be a reactive active and a proactive approach so that's going to be very very important vis-a-vis -vis 
the, uh, our growth is concerned, vis-a-vis -vis the growth of any industry, any, any industry is concerned. So there has to be this type of a approach. And that is what we have been talking about vis-a-vis -vis medical and wellness tourism also. So for, for, uh, for medical tourism, more or less people are trying to look towards to receive a treatment for a diagnosed ailment. So somebody who has already has a pre-diagnosed problem, he travels from one country to another or one state to another or one region to another to get himself cured and to take, uh, taken care of. Medical tourism uh, would somehow involve some invasive surgeries also. Uh, there would be a lot of treatments which may be non-invasive, but there would be invasive surgery also. Usually people are uh, looking at invasive techniques uh, so that they are, things are taken care of. For example, your dental dental problems or your orthopedic problems or your heart related problems. Wellness more or less is tries to work towards the improvement of the health or the overall general well-being of the people. Uh, wellness obviously is one of those factors which could also lead, lead to your uh, work output, which could also lead towards uh, you being very motivated towards what you are trying to actually do it. And it, it in a way, in, in a way, it, it actually leads a person towards uh, growth. So overall, well, uh, well-being of an individual is taken care by wellness. And uh, one is trying to, uh, whenever one is under stress or uh, mental uh, issues are cropping up, I think wellness is one of those things which can help you come out of it. Every destination around the globe has something unique to offer, has something unique to build up and something different to provide. Um, I've got a map over here from uh, Global Wellness Institute, which talks about the various uh, niche things that each and every country or each and every continent possesses. And uh, folks, you can look at meditation, yoga and Ayurvedic retreats that are very popular in, in our country. In fact, the whole of the Himalayan region, these are going to be very popular and uh, because of the all traditional herbs and all those things available over here. And you, if you take a look at Caribbean uh, island, we have wellness cruises in that particular part of the world. So these are all uh, some, somewhere wellness takes care of some sort of lifestyle disorders also. If you can look at, if you look at the complete breakup that I'm showing over here, uh, somewhere uh, lifestyle disorders can be corrected because of the wellness uh, that we uh, wellness techniques that are there along. If you go to Australia also, surf and yoga retreats are very, very common. And uh, if you can look at Africa, there are thermal hammams and all those things. So all, all, all different types of aspects are available vis-a-vis -vis wellness is concerned. Well, in 2017, this was a 639 billion market. So that was a huge one. And by 2022, uh, the projection was that it will be 919 billion dollar market so but obviously we can uh, say because of this hiccup that major hiccup that we have encountered there could be some changes in what we are what we are looking at but still it's going to be a huge market and this is going to be one of those industries which in which people are going to invest in times to come because uh, your mental well-being your health uh, uh, is very important and as we have been always referring towards the fact uh, i just got a quote somewhere today which said that earlier it used to be time is money but now health is money so if you have health if you are if your overall uh, health is uh, in order and if you are in a uh, fit enough you will obviously be able to grow and earn a lot of money uh, i have also given some sort of projected expenditure estimates for 2017 to 2022 you can always look at these particular factors and you can see asia pacific has a substantial uh, substantial amount of percentage that is around 13% of it so to of the total wellness industry so that's that that that's a, that's a, that's a huge number this i had uh, discussed and this we have been getting from UNWTO earlier it was projected around 650 million loss of work 650 million for this particular year but now we are looking at that more than 1.1 billion international tourists will not be traveling this year that's a huge number more than 1.1 billion international tourists. This is still a projection. These projections are changing after every uh, fortnight or a 10 days or 15 days. We are changing up uh, projections. But the heartening factor is, as we have seen in India also, that uh, from, uh, from day after tomorrow, that's 25th, at least the domestic flights in some circuits are, start, uh, are going to operate. So once these operations start, once these uh, uh, flights start operating, obviously there's going to be huge uh, influx of tourists and tourists starts going to grow. Uh, loss of 1.2 trillion US dollars. Again, this export revenues, this is, a, uh, this is also a projection, but I think another 15, 20 days, we'll have more clarity with what's going on. 120 million direct jobs are being missed. So as we know that uh, we, we have been talking about the fact, and this was a common proven fact for every 10,000 US dollars invested, 
we had uh, we were providing in the tourism and hospitality industry for every 10000 us dollars invested we were able to provide jobs to around about 70 to 75 people which was far more than the manufacturing sector also so you can see the amount of people who were directly or indirectly employed within this particular hospitality and tourism industry so they are being impacted and this number is also growing this is also just a uh, just a projection as of today but uh, this will also grow in a bigger way uh, i have been constantly talking about the fact that the first aspect of tourism that is going to start growing is going to be domestic tourism that's going to be domestic tourism and what is the big yeah nikhil can you mute this uh, is everything fine yes sir i have muted him okay yeah so uh, that's what we have been uh, trying to work up and trying to build up that uh, domestic demand is going to be the first one that is going to pick up is going to pick up faster than international uh, demand and we have been always expressing the fact that within the domestic aspect also religious tourism is going to be based upon the fact that which is actually going to be the first because it is uh, first mover and religious because i i've been constantly referring towards the fact that the people are more emotionally connected to religious aspects so religious tourism is going to be one of those uh, based upon previous crisis leisure travel is expected to recover quickly also particularly travel for rejuvenation and recreation this is according to unwto which is also uh, very key uh, very keenly following all these things and has been constantly referring to the fact that these are the some of the industries that are going to open up uh, here we have uh, given a small uh, bar chart uh, depicting that what are or what, how medical and wellness tourism could be affected until 2021 so what is going to be the projection and which is going to be the area where it is going to uh, grow first so if we can take a look at it we can see that uh, in middle east by may june we expect that uh, some sort of uh, recovery should be built up uh, it, it's going to be around 30% of the recovery is going to be done but asia pacific it is going to be somewhere around negligible i think 4 5% and europe it is going to be 1 or 2% but in times to come uh, to get the recovery to up to 100 uh, 100% it's going to be late 2021 so that's that's a long time from now but uh, obviously as i uh, said earlier also that these recoveries are going to be uh, going to be very beneficial for the tourism industry so covid 19 obviously directly indirectly has impacted uh, medical tourism because uh, because of the fact that people have been constantly referring towards the fact that social distancing is the new norm that we have social distancing is a new protocol that we have uh, and uh, i primarily i personally feel that social distancing is not the appropriate word but the appropriate appropriate word is physical distancing so once we are looking at the fact that we want to be physically uh, away from each other so that's a very very important aspect so how, how will health or medical tourism grow in such days or such times it's going to be very very important aspect and how we are going to actually cope up with this thing it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a very tricky uh, uh, thing mm. i just hold on i think uh, we we're getting some disturbance nikki can you sort that out i would once sir, again sir i'm yeah i'm working on it sir yeah i'm requesting once again everybody to please keep their audios on mute both so uh, if we look at it uh, china has 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 been the one which has the majority of outbound medical tourists so more than 1 million that is 10 lakh people uh, move out of china for health related aspects so they are chinese are the most number of uh, most number of health related tourists to go to different countries especially to south korea japan and us and south korea around about gets 350 000 lakhs 50 000 medical tourists uh, every year and one amongst them is coming from china so obviously at this moment the way the uh, the international politics is fanning out the way things are working out internationally and where the countries as i told in my earlier lectures also that 75% of destinations around the globe have international travel restrictions 95% have travel restrictions but 75% of them have international uh, travel restrictions so that is a huge number so from which country you are going to allow people to come over to your uh, to your place and whether china is going to allow or whether chinese are going to be allowed or whether indians are going to be allowed so that's going to be a very tricky situation in uh, days to come and also the political turmoil and the political chaos that 
COVID-19 has built up. So that's going to be a very, very deciding factor vis-a-vis -vis how people and who people from which countries are going to be allowed to move on and uh, uh, allowed, to, uh, allowed to build up. Uh, hospitals, spas, all these places where, uh, where wellness, health tourism is going on or medical tourism is going on would require to be uh, using modern marketing techniques to, in order to attract customers, but would also require to have updated uh, sanitization techniques on hand uh, so that uh, the customer whosoever is coming to them or a tourist whosoever is coming to them is fully assured of the fact that everything is going to be fine when they reach that particular place. So obviously new normals are being built up, new guidelines are being built up, new thought processes are, are coming up and these thought processes are being evaluated by even the apex organizations the member states of UNWTO and obviously we what i see even uh, good organizations or uh, organizations like ice or icri or apecri they are also trying to work up and come up with their own thoughts vis-a-vis -vis how things could move and how things could evolve in times to come so uh, what i uh, what i feel is that uh, covid-19 obviously is a wake up call uh, for everyone and this also, in a way, talks about the fact that we should be more, more concentrated towards the wellness of each individual. Every individual that is, say, we are close to 8 billion people, above 7 billion people in, around the globe. Everybody has to concentrate on the wellness of what they have. I've been constantly talking about flexibility, resilience, self-care, team care, and workplace care. Resilience is very important. Be sure and be flexible in whatever approaches that you have been uh, trying to build up. Uh, hashtag stay home today, hashtag uh, travel tomorrow. So you have to stay back and take care of things that you have on, uh, on hand. And uh, that's what we have been uh, looking at. So, okay, so that's, that's something from my side. I'll stop sharing. Uh, over to you, Perry. It's, it's your turn. And I made you the co-host so you can easily start sharing your screen. Okay, well, thank you very much and good, uh, very good afternoon from Malaysia to you all. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, very and, um, and also from your, from your <coughs> Vice Chancellor of the University and the President there, really interesting to hear that. And uh, I'll um, hopefully today, as I just try and work get my sharing happening here, uh, is that working? Yeah, you can see your screen. Got it? Excellent. Fantastic. Um, look, really, uh, as I said, a, a, a very warm welcome um, to myself for a topic that's uh, very close to my heart, as I'll explain later, um, to talk about health, wellness, and, and medical tourism and where we're at and where we're going with things in the world. Um, my background uh, is, uh, although I live and work here in Malaysia, uh, I've lived here for the last eight years. Uh, originally, I'm from, uh, as you may have picked up from my bio, from the UK, but I've lived and worked in the US and Australia for many, many years, and also have had the privilege of being connected with institutions in other countries. Uh, I'm also very pleased to say that I have had on occasion to visit India, and uh, again, I'm always looking forward to those uh, opportunities and uh, COVID has sadly grounded me along with a lot of other people from making those trips and so uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitations in the past to travel and, and one day hopefully not not too distant future I'll be able to, to do that. My presentation today is actually drawn from a conference we hosted here at my home university at Sunway University in Malaysia uh, last year, we hosted the second international conference on health oriented tourism and hospitality. And uh, again, uh, there was supposed to have a third conference this year, which was going to be in, in Bangkok. Sadly, again, it's had to be postponed. But again, I think it speaks to the interest that there is out there about hospitality and health and tourism and, and the connections. And I really want to, to talk about that. And um, uh, Professor Prakashad, thank you so much for that very, very good introduction and, uh, because it, it really did uh, give a, a, cover a whole range of topics and issues that I'm going to try and touch on in the next 20 odd minutes. For those of you who don't know much about Malaysia, um, uh, that's where I'm based. It's only a couple of hours away from India and uh, in normal times we'll be welcoming increasing number of Malaysians to come uh, to visit us. And uh, 
Um, the country is, uh, as you can see, is in sort of in two parts. So an interesting history and background, and I'm based in Kuala Lumpur in the capital, which is well known, particularly for the Twin Towers. So Sunway University is located uh, in KL, and uh, you can see the, the top of the university at the back there, but the reason I like to use this photograph is because this speaks to the history of the site we're on, which I'll, I'll again show you in a moment. So it's a very modern university uh, set in actually Sunway City. And part of the reason that I think this is interesting and, and pertains to what we're talking about today is that uh, our founder uh, is, because we're a private not-for-profit university, is very focused on the health uh, aspects, particularly through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we actually have a Jeffrey Sachs Center. Uh, Professor Sachs is actually based at Columbia University in New York. Uh, he's also an honorary professor at the university. And we've taken a big focus on this issue of sustainability and the connections with health. And that's partly because of our history. So this was the original site of the university. It was an old tin mine. So the site I showed you before of the lake was actually uh, basically a tin mining pit. And so we've developed this site from what you see there uh, to what is now uh, a modern suburb of KL. And uh, the company has got huge developments uh, in progress, as you can see from these photographs, some are, some are already there uh, and some are planned. And uh, unusually for us, uh, the university is, a, as I said, a foundation within the company. So over 16,000 employees across the Sunway Group. And one of our other divisions, interestingly, particularly pertaining to this uh, today, is uh, medical. So we also have a hospital right next to us and in the process of building five more hospitals. And what's relevant in that context is that Sunway Medical Center, our existing hospital, is very dependent on international tourists. And we have a, even have a specialized Japanese patient center, for example. So I just thought I'd give you that just to give a little bit of context to what I'm talking about today, because the university, unusually for a we're right in the middle of this, literally, and uh, uh, as an organization. Myself, uh, I, I don't have a medical background. My, my, my background is more in marketing. And so to pick up on some of the final points there of Professor Parkashad later, where I want to be talking about some of the issues related to how uh, particularly destinations need to market themselves and we'll have to do a better job and a different job of doing that in the future. So about 25 years ago, actually, I wrote an article about tourism, health and quality of life. So that's quite a while ago now. And it's quite interesting when I revisit some of the issues that were being discussed at, at, at that time. And as was picked up in the opening presentation, issues of stress in the workplace. So it's not just those, those uh, medical issues. And the whole topic that I'm keen to focus on today. In India is a big player. And as I was digging around, why has India been so successful? So traditional things that come out from the medical part, we'll talk about the wellness a bit later, is that, well, there's no waiting list, you've got high quality treatment, world-class facilities, top surgeon, all very rational kind of things. And I'll come back to those sorts of issues uh, later on. My question is, is going out of the COVID situation where suddenly everybody is talking about health because health is going to dominate tourism for the facility. How are destinations going to position themselves, given the implications of what's happened with tourism and health. Because suddenly it is the focus. Um, it didn't used to be. Uh, but now everyone, when you can talk about tourism, when you're going to talk about traveling, as I'll show in the next section of my presentation, how dominant health aspects will be. Now, obviously, COVID is part of everybody's life. I don't think there's anyone I'm talking to who's, who's not. Uh, we've fortunately not had major pandemics in, in about 100 years. But that pandemic happened, and the big concern about that pandemic was, in fact, it came in waves. In fact, the second wave killed considerably more people than the first wave. And for tourism, this is the big worry. 
that we may have got through this initial hump, but what lies ahead? Maybe because we're more aware of it, maybe because we've got contact tracing technology, maybe we'll be able not to walk into the same problems as history uh, might allude us to, to, to think about. Now, for the tourism industry, this has been hugely significant. The last time the industry was grounded was actually back in 2001 after 9-11. And literally then, it was only for a, few, a matter of a few weeks, not months. Yet the implications were significant for the industry. So at this point in time, we've got entire airlines, entire continents that are just grounded. No one is literally going anywhere much. Um, over 16,000 planes have been parked, and these are not parked in short-term storage, by the way. These are planes that are going into long-term storage. So when we look at the recovery phase, uh, even now you can anticipate that this is not going to happen very quickly. When we look at past uh, cases of health, uh, particularly you know, something like um, SARS, which was probably the biggest impact, uh, as you can see, it took many, many months. And in fact, I was just looking at some data about international students. It took five years for international students to bounce back from China into Australia. Five years. So many, in many cases, people have been thinking in months. And I think now the airline industry is beginning to see years. And that's why there's now been a lot of talk about not bringing back into service a lot of the big A380 aeroplanes because of the concerns that travel will not pick up very quickly. So the shift after 9-11 was about security. The shift after COVID is going to be health. So airports and the tourism industry put a huge amount of focus on um, issues relating to uh, health, uh, sorry, security. And now that is going to change. And that's going to be the big focus going forward. So the big change will be de destinations now talking about health uh, and what is going to be brought in at airports. And this is going to change our travel experience. And you can already see airlines are now bringing this in. Etihad and Emirates Airlines have been testing different types of technology. Uh, this one from Etihad is to test you so that you can even be looked at from about a metre and a half away. They can read your passport, read your biometrics, see if you've got a temperature, because the concept now of high touch is walked away, because no one wants, the way the virus spreads, no one wants touch. So already we saw before things shut down, uh, countries like Thailand had introduced health certificates, changes in health insurance. So, Front and centre, before you can even be able to get an airline ticket, you're going to have to prove aspects of health. Now, in the past, a lot of people travelled because they were ill. They were actually going for bed. This is going to really change how tourism and health interact. And th this is going to cause some major dislocation at various destinations as a result. Already we're seeing a bit of overkill. This is a... a Famous supermodel Naomi Campbell. This was um, her hazmat chic suit before she was travelling. Uh, so we're not even going to dress healthy. We're going to have to be that way. So most airlines that are flying are now demanding everyone wears masks. In fact, I just got an email from Emirates Airlines about that this morning. We can see that that's what you're going to be expected to pick to, to travel with: thermometers, contact tracing on your phone, masks, pills. That's going to be the new normal. Now, the reason I harp on this is because this is, again, as I mentioned, putting health very central to the tourism experience. Whereas in the past, health was really pushed out there. People would talk about it, like, oh, I need to get away for a bit of a holiday to relax. Uh, we'll be doing medical tourism. But it was, a, it was a niche. It was not a central part of what's going on. And now health is going to be right there in centre it's gonna become part of the new normal for new travel. And that's gonna be very different. And that's gonna make people think about health a lot more than they have done in the past because literally their lives depend upon it. So that's really, really gonna change things. So whether it's where investment of technology is gonna go in airlines with biometric check-ins, 
social distancing. Uh, this is already being brought in in Bali in, in, in airports. Uh, and you can see here the, the changes that this is going to bring to how people sit, how people interact. And of course, in India, you can imagine the challenges this is going to be. And I was interested to see that some places want two meter rule. India saying, we can't do that. My own university is saying, well, we can do a meter. Health officials are saying, well, when you sneeze, you can actually spread it eight meters. So we've got politics coming into play with health, with reality. But nevertheless, health is going to be all around us much more. So whether it's boarding an airplane, whether it's going to be sitting on the plane, we've already got airlines coming out with new uh, hostess uniforms. Health is going to be in our face, literally, quite literally. So whether it's designs, uh, whether it's one of our arrivals, all the messages about health are going to be around us. Now, Tourism has literally stopped. This is like turning off your computer. The question is, when we restart, do we want to load in the same programs and software as we had when we shut it down? Now, some people will. They'll just want to go back to, let's say, December 2019 and assume all will be well. I think we also have to ask, is that the tourism we want? When things come back, how do we want them to come back? Now, there will be constraints, of course. But it does beg the question in our mind, what could we envision it to be? Can we think of how things could be different? Obviously, as I said, there's going to be constraints because the health aspects are going to bring that in. But do we just want to go back to the way everything was before? So, oh, going the wrong way. Here. So, when we think about how tourism, and as was made in the, the opening presentation, Literally, we have dropped off a cliff. And when you look at the impact of this, you can see that on the right-hand side, what's happened in Thailand. Now, that's about tourism. Now, Thailand, again, is a destination that is heavily connected to medical tourism. So if we look at the largest company, for example, this is what's happened to Boomerang. 66% of their revenues have literally fallen off a cliff. Now, Boomerang Hospital is one of the oldest, probably for 30 years, it's been a central part of medical tourism. In the US, it's left the over 5,500, around about five, over 5,000 hospitals. They are literally sitting idle. Uh, they now reckon that half the hospital beds in the US are, are, are being empty. And as they said, even if we reopen, will patients come? Because there is now an increasing fear of this in the medical area. When we look at this in other contexts, here in Malaysia, private hospitals are now saying that numbers have dropped by 70 to 80%. Literally medical tourism, a lot of it which was elective, now some of it of course was not, but people have been postponing and they've been putting it off. They're worried, I believe, that they're gonna catch COVID if they go to a hospital, because people who've got COVID go to hospitals. So this has been the kind of the rollout. So this is the situation in Malaysia. If we look at India, you can see uh, as uh, Dalit Chopra, who, the uh, president of the Foundation of Healthcare and Promotion in India said, today they stare at a dark future. Because for many of the players in the Indian tourism market, as in a number of other countries, things have literally, just like for the rest of tourism, stopped. So what's been the impact? Well, Again, up to 90% is what we're looking at. So the implications of this for hospitals have been huge. They're also having to lay off staff and doctors. Uh, there is this huge now um, gap that's happened. Uh, and of course, how this tourism, health medical tourism comes back is going to be really critical in terms of how it relates to tourism quarantining, how we open up borders, how we restart tourism and the points that were made in the opening presentation. So if we look at the, the situation, what we're also seeing is that people, so even the World Economic Forum has been looking at this and has been pointing out that nearly all hospitals around the world have actually seen less and less people come. Okay, so there have been a lot of people coming with COVID, but not for other things. So there's been a huge drop off in people attending, coming to hospitals. 
Now that doesn't mean suddenly the population is healthy. What it does mean is that people are not attending to those health concerns. And what's gonna happen in that? So that over 200,000 weekly screenings in just the UK alone have not happened. So we're, we've got to have another health time bomb that's going to be going on. And the longer that COVID goes on, that's going to be the problem. Now, you can just see from this chart, this is just a case of the UK, but looking at doubling the number of people to 8 million, okay, for people waiting for hospital care. The UK has only got a population of 60 million. So that's a really significant number. And if we look at the numbers that are growing here, the number of people looking for medical tourists, this is from the UK, you could see how that market was growing. And the reason it was growing was there simply wasn't enough treatment in the UK. So where are those people gonna go? How is this gonna work out in the future? Now, when we look across tourism from a global wellness economy point of view, we can see different countries and where the growth has been. And India, of course, featured very strongly in that. Uh, I was kind of amused by this cartoon I picked out of an Indian newspaper, which was looking at people arriving at the airport. And as you can see, the onlooker there looks at all these people coming through and saying, oh my goodness, crash victims. Oh no, no, this is great, it's medical tourism. So again, you know, the, this is an interesting situation where Tourism, which was never thought of before that way, has become very, very significant. On a more broader picture, if we look at the growth in the world population, we're seeing a, the world has got a bigger population, but we're also looking at an aging population. And when you look at the statistics in most Western countries, about 80% of your medical care in your entire life will be spent in the last 18 months you're alive. Now, so this is a bit like only servicing your car just before you get rid of it. So the challenge we're gonna be faced with is that an aging population is gonna be very expensive. And as you look at this chart, you can see the growth of that from 7% to 16% of the world's population by 2020. So global healthcare spending is going to increase. We can see that simple demographics, looking at that will tell you what's gonna happen with that. Now, different destinations around the world have become well known for different types of health medical tourism. And most of the focus has been on that because it's much easier to count tourists who come in for that in the health, in what I call the medical sector, than the wellness sector. So we tend to conflate medical and wellness together, and I think this is a problem. And I think the industry, and if I can use that term for this, needs to step back and understand really what we're talking about. So from medical tourism, you can see there, and this is from 11 years ago, this, this data, 2009, where India kind of sat in that, okay? Now, if we go forward a bit, you can see where India sits. So India sits, you know, in terms of top global medical tourism, in terms of its worth, these are the a number of other top destinations. Thailand, I've already mentioned, Germany, Turkey. Iran is quite significant in this market as well. So a lot of countries, and obviously where I didn't work here in Malaysia uh, as well. Now, if we look forward at the market for India, you can begin to see the expectation over the next seven to eight years where they could see that the growth was going to be. And clearly India was going to be a very significant part of that going forward. So before COVID arrived, signs were looking very good. But of course, as I said, you've got huge waiting lists and a lot of that was based on this. So you can see there going back to the UK figures, great. So these destinations were growing because of that. But it's not just medical waiting lists. As was pointed out in the opening presentation, it's about the way we live our lives. It's about stress, it's about wellness, it's not just about hospitals. So the trouble we've had is that when we talk about traveling, a lot of our traveling has not what I would call travel well. It's been about we travel because we can eat too much. We can, you know, we're traveling at speed, which again is stressful. We're seeing and being seen. You don't even look at the number of people who die from selfie deaths to see that. We stay in as part of tourist groups. We don't necessarily sleep very well and we've got lots of exposure to disease. To travel when we look at wellness is rethinking that. It's about healthy living. It's about taking time. It's about meaning and connection. It's about relaxation. 
And thanks to COVID now, particularly, it's going to be about making sure you don't catch any other disease. So it's about prevention. If we go back to the very history of modern tourism, this was a British guy called um, uh, Thomas Cook. And in fact, what people don't know much about Thomas Cook was his first tour was actually a health-related tour. So this was his first expedition train trip, which he organized back in 1841, which was on the 5th of July. And actually what it was, was a train journey from, from, um, uh, uh, from Leicester to a temperance, which is a no alcohol meeting, which was being held in Loughborough. That was the first ever trip he organized. So even when we look back at the, 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 the foundations of modern tourism, a health and wellness aspect was actually embedded in that. When we look at India, obviously India has made that, that to that. And we can see a lot of medical tourists don't necessarily want to travel. So there's lots of push reasons why people go. One of my favorite movies is the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, which is set in India. And this particular actress, uh, one of my favorite as well, her whole reason for being there was to have an operation. The challenge is wellness tourists travel because the wellness is integral part of the experience. So we can look at tourism and health being, if you want, if you like, rather diametrically opposed parts of that. As Dr. Professor Parakshet pointed out, a lot of it's about wellness. The, the town I lived in in Australia, my hometown there, is called Byron Bay, which is probably the most wellness type of focus destination. My hometown in the UK, which is a little place called Woodhall Spa, again, spas in the name, this is the spa. It was closed down back in 1983. So a lot of people assume that all health and wellness is growing. I've got news for you, it's not necessarily the case. In fact, even if we look at a more modern example, in Singapore, medical tourism is not growing, it is declining. So we shouldn't assume that when we use the words health and wellness, it's all about growth and good times. It's not. So the challenge is how can destinations position themselves to do that? Now, when we look at different types of travelers, we can see all types coming up in there. Leisure, religious, business, health and medical is just one of them. And if you look at wellness, you can include a lot of things in wellness. And again, I think that is somewhat problematic as to how we count that. Because every tourist who eats, every tourist who travels will eat. Are they a culinary tourist? That begs some questions on that. So when we look at tourism from a health and wellness point of view, where do we want people to go? And there are different destinations. So how do you differentiate your destination? So going forward, how is India going to differentiate itself from other destinations? And what is going to make? Now, you don't have to go far to find that information. When we look at medical tourism, we can see we have medical and we have health. When we start combining the two, we have to start looking more seriously at the different aspects of, that, of, of health tourism. And I think that's when we need to break it down. So we can see at this continuum, we have illness, prevention and medical tourism. We have business tourism and leisure tourism. Some of it is about prevention, some of it's about treatment. So as we look at this on the health illness dimension, as you can see at the bottom of this chart, this helps us to understand a little bit better about the overarching thing we need to talk about, which is health tourism, and where we can look at spa and wellness versus that health aspect. So this takes us to understand medical and wellness. And going forward out of COVID, they are going to need different marketing strategies for each of these. So if this is medical tourism, this is how we can envision wellness tourism. And how we communicate our destinations and how we position as destinations is going to need quite different imagery because if health is so central to what we're now doing when we travel, so traditionally in marketing, the medical tourism is rational, outcome directed, often it's facilities are needed, it's about having external experts, it's often price driven, hospitals need accreditation, and the destination is optional. Oops. And when we look again, this was a, a, an ad I picked out of um, uh, 
uh, one which is basically pointing out a cartoon saying we have the best of everything. When we look at wellness, we look at things on a different Wellness in covers a much more broader range of activities, and therefore the marketing of it is quite different. So whereas medical tourism was about the rational, wellness tourism is about the emotion. It's about life enhancing. Technology may or may not be needed. It's about value. It's very destination specific. And so as India goes forward in marketing its health tourism, it needs to craft different messages for medical, and for wellness. So the good news for a destination like India, given COVID, is in the short term, there is going to be a huge backlog of operations. People will not have been to hospitals, and I think most hospitals and destinations will be very busy. But as we look to the future, there is then a question of how are people going to be traveling for health? Because if health is perceived as being unhealthy, because you might catch COVID still, how is that going to change people thinking about traveling for health? So as I finish up, the key thing I think for people to think about is that restoring confidence is going to be crucial. The work that IATA has already done shows you that a lot of people are going to wait before they think about travel. And this speaks to this concern. So when we're talking about health tourism, we've got to get people to, be, to get over their fear of re-engaging. Now, already some destinations are doing this. So in the case of Vietnam, Vietnam new tourism message is safe Vietnam tourism. That's their domestic campaign. Their international campaign, which they, they're waiting to launch as soon as they get permission to allow international visitors, will be Vietnam now, safe and smiling. Now, right next door is Thailand. Thailand just announced four days ago their new campaign. Originally, it's been amazing Thailand. And the new campaign is amazing trust in Thailand because, again, it's all about the health. Do you trust to go there? Do you trust the destination? So health is now going to be completely implicit in tourism. And I guess my question going forward is going to be, what is going to be India's marketing message in this? How is India going to be able to position itself for this new world and this new reality? All right. I think that's been, uh, uh, hopefully that's, uh, uh, Pakistan has given a few thoughts about uh, how destinations can think about uh, marketing and where health and tourism is going to have to be positioned as we go forward in this post-COVID period. So, back Thank to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That, that was a very enlightening presentation. And uh, I think you had a buzzer also where you were timing that how long it's going to be. I, I try to keep on time. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know you are very smart, so you do all these things. Uh, but it was good, like very, very insightful. And uh, the, especially the last two aspects, I think uh, for all my participants over here who are from hospitality and tourism industry, start thinking fast. If Vietnam is building it up, Thailand is building it up, what are we going to have? What are we going to use a prefix with an incredible India? So how Incredible India is going to be uh, repositioned or rebuilt and reworked up. And I, I was also thinking of one very important aspect, and that's it. Uh, that's that the tomorrow's tourists will be one of the fittest people around because you have to be very strong vis-a-vis -vis your immunity is concerned so that you don't catch any disease or something when you're traveling and you're able to take up all the hardship. So it's, it's just not going to be leisure, but you have to exercise and build up your immunity before you embark on any journey. Thank you, Perry. Well, well, you're quite right. Already certain the cruise companies have said you'll have to get a health certificate before you can get on a cruise ship if you're over 70, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think this, the whole positioning of health and tourism is going to be like, I'm going to get a passport. Where's my health certificate? We'll go with that now. And, and that's really going to redefine people's thinking about health and tourism. So it's, it's something going to be like people before going to space or to moon, they start exercising and they become fit and <laughs> the habits. So I think it's going to be something that if I have to go to US and stay there for 10, 15, 20 days, so these are the benchmarks vis a vis my health is concerned and that is going to be there. Nikhil, our questions are ready. So you can start sharing the screen, Nikhil. Yes, yes, yes. We can take a few of them. So I think that's that's going to be one of those things that I need to start going to the gym and I need to start going running, doing some running so that 
hit enough to travel. So, uh, here we have our questions coming up. So, okay, so when hotel industry will open up, as we know, that, uh, so there are a couple of, uh, I think, which one you're going to take, Perry, first? It's all your I can't, I just, I can't see, I've got chats, but I've not got any, I haven't got any, I can't see any questions here, actually. So maybe you can yeah. throw them at me and I'll, um, Okay. I'll respond. So, uh, there is some, can, one of the persons is asking that after this pandemic, there will be fastest recovery in hospitality and tourism industry as discussed by experts. So that's what I am saying. Having this thing in mind, there will also be demand for ample availability of resources. Resource is used in order to serve the hospital and due to this scarcity of resources would be there because of demand at large. What will be the sustainable ways in order to use these resources at optimum level in order to save the hospitality and tourism industry from this scarcity? Okay, yep. so, I've got them. Yeah, so, yep. yeah go ahead. Uh, you, you'll take it first? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, um, all right. So would you like to start with those questions on the screen? When will the hotel industry reopen? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I just read the third question where the... Uh, oh, Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah where, the, um, where the respondent wants to know that uh, uh, if if the hospitality and tourism industry is the fastest to recovery and uh, it's going to start using the resources very fast, so where is the sustainability aspect? So if we again start utilizing all the resources, so how will the sustainability aspect come into it? So I'll answer it first, and you can take it over there. Yes, I, I I've been constantly advocating this fact that. Uh, hospitality industry is going to be the fastest one and it's going to be uh, a lot of use of resources obviously in times to come but uh, just keep this thing in mind when when I say fastest and when I say it is going to recover we have a three to four years horizon in mind so it's not going to be at this moment yesterday uh, there was a, this uh, the, there's this news coming up uh, that we are back to 2006 levels of pollution is concerned and all those things are concerned so it's not going to be as that fast that we'll start will be again to the same levels where 2019 stage is reached, December 2019 stage is reached, and we're using all the resources. And obviously, uh, the SDG goals of UAWTU stay, and uh, countries always will work, up, uh, work out uh, within those sustainability norms itself. Over to you, Perry. Um, look, I think, uh, as I was, was hinting at in my presentation, we have hit a restart moment. And I think uh, the silver lining, if I can put it to the COVID cloud, mm -hmm. is a question about whether we can revision the world, let alone tourism, to be something that is more sustainable. Um, I absolutely agree that it's going to take many years for tourism to climb back up. I, I, sadly, I think there will be some second ways or many ways of COVID which will make the recovery for the industry very problematic because it will uh, occur in different places at different times, and it'll be a bit like firefighting. It will be quite difficult probably for the world and for different countries uh, to deal with it. Um, going forward, clearly, I think tourism and hospitality was on an unsustainable path. We'd seen that with destinations being closed in the Philippines, Boracay, in um, uh, parts of Thailand, uh, et cetera. And destinations were still just counting tourists as a way to show they were growing and doing well. And as you've seen from pictures of cruise ships in Venice, it's all got too hard, too much. And I think the world has got to move away from that and has got to take a, a, a big gulp to reconsider that. And I think that's already happening. Um, many of the airlines are now realizing that they don't think that their A380 aircraft are ever going to go back into the sky. Now, that's really changing. Uh, that, that, that's a really big move for an airline like Emirates, which has got 115 of these planes. That's really significant when they say they, they don't think they can get the biggest planes back in the sky. So I agree with uh, Professor Brown said there that tourism will take a time to come back. And we have to vision the type of tourism we want to come back. Because if we just go back to the way it was and want more of it, then it, we're just going to end up with a really significant set of problems down the line. Climate change on the planet, 
uh, sustainability issues are not going to go away. So we need to use this, this time of COVID to rethink things. Uh, rethink work, rethink stress, rethink a lot of things. Uh, yeah. I was interested to see that the Prime Minister of New Zealand wanted to introduce a four-day working week. They're using this as an opportunity to rethink. That's what I'm thinking, that uh, uh, before COVID, like December 2019, one of the hottest topic, research topic was over-tourism. So a lot of articles over tourism were coming and now they are gone. Like Barcelona was protesting. People were protesting in Barcelona that this over tourism and all that. So it's, it's going to be something. And, but uh, obviously when we have a fresh start, the, we are lucky that we know what, we, what wrongs we had done. We are going to make a fresh start. So let's, let's cover them up. So another question is the question number fourth that relates to today's yep. topic that how to innovate in the health tourism uh, industry, keeping in mind the COVID factor post lockdown. So what, what would be the innovative practices in the health tourism? Well, I, I guess where I was really trying to focus my presentation was the fact that you've got to, when we talk about health, I think there's two distinctive kind of markets. There is medical and there's the wellness. And I think health um, so destination for realize the the health front. Of the, the reason I was spending that time in my presentation showing you what's happening around the world at present is because that's going to become the new normal. Now, public health in, in India, dare I say, on my previous visits, has, has probably not been front and center. If you go to somewhere like Japan, it very clearly is. Just public cleanliness, public toilets, facilities, really basic stuff. And I'm afraid that that will become really much more important to tourists, and both domestic and international, because of the health focus. So I think every aspect of health uh, has to be looked at. Um, hotels now, uh, I mean, in the past, when you went to a hotel, the last person you wanted to see was the cleaner. Now, when you go to a hotel, the first person you're going to want to see is the cleaner because you're going to want to know that place has been properly sanitized. So this is going to turn everything on its head. And I think hospitality and tourism need to think cleverly, and you're already beginning to see that. I was reading about a restaurant in Sydney in Australia the other day that now has a hand sanitizer sommelier so rather than the sommelier bringing you the wine list, the sommelier will bring you a range of different hand sanitizers for you to choose from. Now, I thought that was very clever because it was reinforcing to the customers the importance of using hand sanitizer, but making the customer part of the choice, giving them a feeling of being part of it. Another restaurant I saw in the UK had, divide, had started hanging shower curtains, uh, see-through shower curtains by every table. And so you could still see through the shower curtains because they're, 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 they're clear, but it made every table like a separate booth. And that is going to allow people. So I think innovations like this are going to become a lot more normal. Yeah, uh, I, I saw that in Czech Republic also, they, could, they had built up this two meter dimensions and the tables were fixed within that and they were separate. And uh, in my last slide, as I was showing uh, self-care, Workplace care, team care. So by self-care, I mean to say, first, the destinations have to prove that they are themselves taking care of their own inhabitants. Everybody over there is uh, fine, healthy. Then only outsiders would like to come over there. So self-care in that uh, terminology would mean that, uh, especially in the case of India or Indian subcontinent or Southeast Asia, that at least you prove that your destinations are up to a certain medical level standards or health and sanitization standards before people would like to come over there. Uh, another question is, what will be the new normal in wellness tourism after the outbreak? <laughs> well, I don't know what the old, the old normal was. The, um, I, I, again, I go uh, back to my, my point where that if I, I'm hoping that as people start to think about wellness, they're thinking about it much more holistically. But again, 
lots of people, when they were talking more about wellness, meant about often, I think, in a spirituality, they were, they were looking at uh, uh, some of the physical aspects around that as well. Again, I come back that the health aspect will become much more important. So facilities, um, uh, operations will have to put the, the cleanliness, the sanitation front and center. And uh, it's quite possible. Um, on one of my more recent visits to India a couple of years ago, I um, went to visit a, a plant of, of, of all things that made spices. I think it's India's largest uh, exporter of spices, a company called Synthonite down in Kerala. I was amazed at how clean that plant was. I would have been quite happy to eat off the floor. So it showed me that I could literally, if you walked outside the gates, it was not so publicly clean, but unbelievable what can be done. So again, I think any operations, and it will come down to that, providing that they're focused, you've got operational plan, train your staff, um, and working to world standards, it's everything suddenly becomes possible. Yeah. Okay, what's the next one? Yeah, yeah. but actually we have, we have overshot our time considerably. <laughs> we have overshot our time considerably. What we are, I'm going to do is, that's what we do is, uh, I'll send all these questions over to you so you can probably type down a couple of replies. And uh, sure. we post them on our FB page and on our uh, blog and everywhere so that everybody is aware of and we post our presentations and we are live on Facebook at this moment. So everything is recorded over there so for the students. But I know today we have overshot our time a lot by more than 18 minutes. So Ram, okay. <laughs> we have right. one more very special thing. Uh, that's our digital selfie that we take. But before that, I'll ask my colleague Ramjit to quickly sum it up uh, within two, three minutes. Sorry, Ramjit, today we are literally uh, short of time. You have to unmute yourself, Ramjit. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, on the behalf of the BIRTH team uh, and uh, International Bible Lecture Series, uh, I would like to thanks to each and everyone who has participated in this lecture and special thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Manojimar Dhar, uh, to uh, uh, giving uh, his uh, motivating and uh, kind word for us. And it's really a matter for us. Uh, and highly uh, great uh, motivation for us to go ahead uh, carry on this uh, in international web lecture series uh, uh, special thanks to all our students and participants across india or uh, 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 from the abroad uh, thanks a lot for your giving your constant support and feedback uh, it is we running uh, already running short of time i'm going to share my slide as soon as possible Uh, well, uh, uh, it, it was a uh, wonderful uh, lecture, uh, Professor Perry. Uh, it's uh, always a uh, pleasure for us to listen to you in, in, in seminars, conferences, uh, even though your online lectures also and other sessions. And uh, Professor Manas, as we uh, know that he's a regular uh, uh, expert and our teacher and mentor, uh, uh, he has taken such a wonderful steps and uh, even though we people are also uh, enjoying uh, the lectures and, and meaningful insights we're getting day by day. Uh, uh, in, in, in each and every new lecture. So these are the highlights that we have uh, uh, tried to take out uh, from your lecture. Of course, the, uh, uh, both the experts has, has given the very, uh, uh, very good idea about uh, the, how the, the health and uh, medical tourism is growing across the country. And of course, what are the common challenges which generally we are facing uh, uh, within India, even, even though uh, this one uh, outside of the uh, India. Uh, to uh, as Professor Manas uh, uh, is always is giving us is a meaningful insight what the recent facts and figures uh, 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 across the world uh, which are very very meaningful and relevant uh, in in in, in uh, Indian and even though uh, even though other other uh, continents as well. Uh, he's mentioned about the very immediate response recovery strategy and of course the. Uh, about uh, he has been talking about the domestic demand or tourism because uh, when you talk about the health or medical tourism or maybe the religious tourism where when the people are emotionally connected and, uh, and and then they don't have that kind of the fear and they really want to go or visit uh, the uh, the at uh, the religious sites or maybe the 
uh, and the very important two aspect he is given that uh, uh, while uh, uh, boosting up the the medical health tourism that is the also uh, uh, the leisure experiences or to rejuvenate yourselves and uh, uh, talking about uh, the new marketing new norms uh, he has been talking about uh, since now you and able to also coming forward to giving uh, giving the idea about this and and officially they have uh, they, they have published on their on the pages but still he he uh, had uh, uh, put that mark right from the first lecture uh, of, of the series from the last uh, one month and uh, uh, of course uh, new technology new norms promoting strategy norms and each and everything uh, which are so important and uh, of course uh, he talked about the again i'm going to repeat is a rag model he's given the react uh, reactive or, or the active or the pro proactive approach uh, which which generally is going to help a lot to the to the industry or tourism or, or maybe tourism admin companies which are uh, which are looking for for a fastest recovery and of course uh, uh, other hand uh, professor parry uh, you know he's also given the very good uh, uh, the comparative uh, uh, facts and figures of the of the different countries and uh, uh of course uh, how the the, uh, the shift has been uh, has been uh, you know has been changed uh, from from uh, uh, especially about in terms of the security checks about the certificates or the new norms about it and whether there is an uh, arrival or the departure or uh, 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 you know uh, uh, about uh, the different aspects of uh, maybe in hospitality industry or maybe in hotel rooms or uh, maybe in international flights well exemplary given in the philippines or ethiopian airlines how they are doing it and uh, uh, a very good relationship has been uh, explained by him in the marketing and positioning strategy especially in indian context uh, how can be position how can be uh, you know the the different metrics is metrics he can uh, come up and and how the specific products of the the customer or the tourist they may choose to destination uh, uh, thank you very much uh, both the experts and uh, thanks a lot to all the participant uh, uh, for attending or participating this particular lectures uh, uh, your feedback and uh, uh, your suggestions are welcome uh, you may reach us uh, at facebook page uh, that i mentioned in my slides and uh, thank you thank you very thank you very much once again uh, on the behalf of the birth team and my co-host nikhil singh chard and special thanks to honorable vice chancellor professor ankit kedar for gracing this occasion thank you thank you very much sir thanks a lot Thank you. 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 Th